We're working our way through the uh, Old Testament story of Jacob, the Old Testament story of Jacob under the title, Faith with a Limp. And uh, we're 2,000 years before the birth of Jesus. We have routed and followed our journey all the way up into Mesopotamia, modern day Turkey, back down into Israel. We're about 50 miles today from reuniting Jacob with his homeland of Canaan. But first, he must cross the river Jabbok, which invites us to consider one of the most mysterious and compelling stories in the entire Bible. And we will do that right after we pray. Have mercy, Heavenly Father, upon our teacher. His sins are many. Help us to see Christ, just Christ. Through Christ we pray. And all the church said. Reading from Genesis chapter 32. And Jacob arose that night and took his two wives, his two female servants, and his 11 sons. And crossed over the ford of, say it with me, Jabbok. Jabbok. And he took them and sent them over the brook and sent over what he had. Then Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of day. Now when he saw that he did not prevail against him, he touched the socket of his hip, and the socket of Jacob's hip was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, let me go, for the day breaks But he said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And so he said to him, what is your name? He said, Jacob. And he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. For you have struggled with God and men and have prevailed. And then Jacob asked, tell me your name, I pray. And he said, why is it that you ask about my name? And he blessed him there. And so Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face and my life is preserved. And just as he crossed over Penuel, the sun rose on him and he limped on his hip. I can remember the first time I read this story, or at least the first time I paid attention to it. I was in my early 20s. I'd recently returned to the faith of my youth and decided it would be good for me to to read the Bible. So I started in the book of Genesis and trucked right along until I got to the story of Jacob. I found a friend in Jacob. His story made sense to me. Having been a scoundrel myself, having kept God at arm's length myself, I could relate to Jacob. My prodigal path didn't take me to Mesopotamia like his did, but it did make a mess out of my life. Like Jacob, I'd broken plenty of promises. Like Jacob, I'd met a few Labans along the way, but I was back on track like Jacob. So his story was easy for me to follow until Jabbok. Jacob is alone on a river bank when out of nowhere a man attacked him. Who was this man? Why was he coming after Jacob? The two went at it all night long, flipping, slipping, dodging, wrestling. And Jacob held his own until the man with one touch on the hip left Jacob disjointed and hobbled. Jacob choked out these words, I'm not going to let you go unless you bless me. My mind was spinning Who is this man? Who is this attacker? If he is God, why did he let Jacob prevail? And if Jacob prevailed, why the busted hip? I had more questions than answers. Then came the dialogue. God wanted to know Jacob's name. How how could God not know Jacob's name? And then God said, essentially, you've won. And he changed his name from Jacob to Israel. Jacob didn't win. The guy was crippled. He walked with a limp for the rest of his life. 
The story made no sense. It makes more sense to me now. Chalk it up to four decades of experiences that have passed since I first read the story, but I have come to see that the road to Canaan includes Jabbok. And that Jabbok is more than just an event in the book of Genesis. But Jabbok is a moment in the life of every person who pursues God. Jabbok is a moment in which you use all of your strength, every ounce of it, only to find that your strength is not enough. Jabbok is a parent in the hospital waiting room. Jabbok is the alcoholic waking up in the apartment full of empty liquor bottles. Jabbok is the habit you can't brace, can't break, or the fear that you can't face. Jabbok is the day that your strut is replaced with a limp. And you stagger forward to face your challenge, your Esau, in God's grace, not your power. By this point, Jacob had said goodbye to his father-in-law, Laban. Mesopotamia, where he has been for 20 years, is in his rearview mirror. He arrived two decades earlier. He was a man on the lamb, you'll remember, only his staff in his hand, fleeing his behemoth brother Esau. He left two decades later with four women who have given him a total of 11 sons and one daughter. He's wealthy now. He led a tribe of servants and droves of sheep, cattle, goats, and camels. Now, we're not told if, if Jacob thought of Esau during those 20 years, but he must have. He surely wondered what kind of welcome awaited him upon his return. He had stolen the birthright from his older brother Esau. He turned Esau into the laughing stock of the clan. The last time he heard Esau's name, it was couched in panic. Jacob's mother had said to him, get out of here before your brother kills you. And Jacob did. Esau would have. Will he now? That was the question on Jacob's mind as he headed south through the hills on the eastern side of the Jordan River. He drew near to Jabbok. Jabbok, a tributary that empties out into the Jordan River. To cross Jabbok was to enter into Esau's county. There was no way for Jacob to reach Canaan apart from going through the homestead of Esau. And the moment he crossed Jabbok, he was in Esau country. And he could not survive in Canaan apart from Esau's forgiveness. Jacob was troubled then. So God did something wonderful. Jacob went his way. Angels of God met him. And when Jacob saw them, he said, Oh, God's camp. And he named it the place Mahanaim, Mahanaim. When Jacob left Canaan 20, dec 20 years earlier, he had received a vision of angels. You'll recall as he slept on the desert floor near the town of Luz with a rock for his pillow, he had seen angels ascending and descending on a ladder. And now as he returns, he sees angels again. And he says, God's camp. This is a Hebrew word which is found elsewhere in the Old Testament to describe a gathering of hundreds of thousands of soldiers. Above Jacob, in other words, was a galaxy of angels. Rank upon rank, they moved in the sky like iridescent ribbons of the aurora borealis. Perhaps it was their presence 
that gave Jacob the courage to send messages to his brother. He told them, give this message to my master Esau. Humble greetings from your servant Jacob. I have sent, sent these messengers to inform my Lord of my coming, hoping that you will be friendly to me. Oh, ever so humble, suddenly humble and kind Jacob. My master Esau, he says, inform my Lord, hoping you'll be friendly to me. Jacob, in language at least, came in humility, pleading for mercy. Did his appeal make a difference? Well, read the next verse and you answer the question. The messengers came back to Jacob and said, we talked to your brother Esau and he's on his way to meet you, but he has 400 militia, 400 men with him. <laughs> A militia of 400 soldiers is thundering in the direction of Jacob. But that's no problem, right? I mean, Jacob has just seen a, a sky full of angels. Certainly, he will turn to his clan, turn to his family. Certainly, he will speak to them in words of faith and tell them to move forward, right? Encourage, correct? Not quite. Jacob was scared. <laughs> Very scared. Panicked, he divided his people, sheep, cattle, and camels into two camps. He thought if Esau comes on the first camp and attacks it, the other camp has a chance to get away. Oh, how Jacob could vacillate. One minute, communing with angels. The next, frightened by soldiers. The guy was back and forth, hot and cold, in and out. He had more waffles in him than IHOP. I didn't like it either, but I... I got that. Lest we be too hard on Jacob, we hurry to read the next passage. Jacob, for the first time, at least in recorded history in 20 years, offered a prayer. And it was a heartfelt prayer in which he essentially said, if you don't help me, God, I'm burnt toast. Save me, please, from the violence of my brother, my angry brother. I'm afraid he'll come and attack us all, me, the mother's and the children. Jacob kicked into high gear. He began sending gifts, hoping to avo avert a bloodbath. He sent some 550 animals in six different groups as gifts, one right after the other. Within short order, the gifts are delivered he sent everyone across the river Jabbok, but he stayed back. We are not told why. Maybe to collect his thoughts. Maybe to write a will. We are not told why. But he stayed at the river Jabbok alone. Alone with his thoughts. Alone with his fears. Alone. What happened next? To deserves a place in the hall of holy moments right there with Moses in the burning bush Elijah on Mount Carmel and Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration in Mount Calvary you make your list I'll make my list but let's make sure both of our lists of holy moments let's make sure they include this one Jacob at Jabbok. Jabbok. Isn't that a great name? Jab Buck. Even the name has a thrust to it. Jab Buck. All night long, Jacob is going to be jabbed and bucked. Jacob, alone at the river, alone with his fears, all by himself with just the sound of a rushing water and the desert wind. Then out of the deep of the night, a man came. But Jacob stayed behind by himself, and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. A man wrestled with him until 
daybreak. Who was this man? Who was this stranger? Jacob would later say, I have seen God face to face, yet my life has been spared. So, best I can tell, he and God went to the mat together. He wrestled with God. The stranger grabbed Jacob around the neck and threw him to the ground. Jacob jumped up and jumped at him, driving his shoulder right into the gut of the attacker until the two fell flat. The stranger pushed him off and pounced on Jacob, pressing his shoulders into the muddy bank, back and forth, back and forth, Jabbok's water surging, the night wind howling, the duo grunting, elbowing, scraping, clawing, straddling, wrestling, jowl to jowl. Body slippery with mud, skin wet with sweat. They said no words. They panted like stallions. They leapt like gazelles. Hours passed, and darkness gave way to a distant gold, and sunrise was not far away. And when the man saw that he would not win the match, he touched Jacob's hip and wrenched it out of its socket. What is going on here? Did Jacob actually prevail against God? The answer is yes, and that's not a good thing. Jacob was a fighter. Jacob had his own resources. Jacob could claw his way, maneuver his way, trick his way out of any problem. All his life, Jacob had relied on Jacob. And now, in what seems to be a scene pre-fated before it happened, God let Jacob do his best only to show Jacob his best wasn't much. Because with one touch, one touch on the hip, God left Jacob to limp the rest of his life. The hip is the largest weight-bearing joint in the body. It engages the strongest muscles. And with one touch, just a touch, the stranger dislocated it. What's more, the hip in this story is more than the joint on the side. The Hebrew word can be used to refer to Jacob's vital organs. Thus the limp left his manhood redefined. The message of the dislocation, Jacob, you may think you're strong, but in the end, you must depend upon the strength of God. So my question to you, do any of you know the mud of Jabbok? Have you been there? You thought you had the wherewithal to save your career? Just work a few more hours, call on a few more clients, roll up your sleeves, put in more effort. For years, your strategy has worked. But then the walls collapsed. The economy nosedived. The company is going under, and it seems like it's going to pull you with it. All of a sudden, you feel your hip out of joint. Your marriage has always been a challenge, but the two of you have kept it together. Yet little by little, the bridge has eroded. You're running out of cope. You're running out of hope. And for the last few evenings, you've hardly spoken. You share the same house, but you don't share the same heart. It's a wrestling match, this marriage. It's on life support. You've kept your addiction a secret. You've mastered the ability to appear sober. You know which vodka to drink and which mouthwash to use. You've prevailed. You've told yourself... You can manage, you've told yourself, and you have, 
But tonight, you never saw that stoplight. And now, the car is a wreck, and so are you. You've never known the inside of a jail cell before, but it looks like you will before the sun is up. And when you walk out, it will be with a limp. Jabbok is the moment of truth. Jabbok is the inflection point in life in which our self-sufficiency is shown to be insufficient. Jabbok is that point in which we are forced to see ourselves and God in an entirely new way and we actually have no choice There is no plan B other than to rely upon God. Do you know the mud of Jabbok? Jacob did. He got the point. Then the man said, let me go for the dawn is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. What's your name? The man asked. And he replied, Jacob. Don't hurry past that. That's more than an admission of his name. It's an admission of guilt. You remember that the name Jacob means trickster, supplanter, heel grabber. It's not a compliment to be called Jacob. And Jacob is saying to God, I've been a Jacob all of my life. I've been a hustler. I've been a trickster. I've been a Jacob. This is a confession. And this confession results in a great grace. He gets, he gets a new name. He needed no convincing. He said, bless me, please. And he cast himself, not on his shrewdness, he cast himself upon God. He said, your name will no longer be Jacob. This is God speaking. From now on, you'll be called Israel because you have fought with God and with men and have won. Please Tell me your name, Jacob said. Why do you want to know my name? The man replied. And then he blessed him there. And Jacob named the place Peniel, which means face of God. For he said, I have seen God face to face, yet my life has been spared. The sun was rising as Jacob left Peniel. And he was limping because of the injury to his hip. Jacob was accustomed to contending and prevailing, but one touch from God, he collapsed in pain. For the remainder of his life, which is still several decades, he will walk with a staff and always walk with a limp. I found myself on the river bank of Jabbok just a few weeks ago. A medical exam disclosed that I have an ascending aortic aneurysm. I'm not great with medical terminology. I love those of you who are. I know just enough to know that aneurysm is not a happy word. And I came to know that when an aneurysm is on the ascending part of your heart, coming out of your heart, That's not a good place for an aneurysm, not on your aorta. I remember that from middle school biology. That's the most important vein in the body. And mine was pretty big. The bulge was large enough to get the attention of a a good-hearted heart specialist. And while awaiting the results of some tests, I did something I should not have done. I got online How many of you know, don't research medical conditions online? (laughs) I read story after story of guys my age, one leaning over to pick up the newspaper and he never got up. Thanks for telling me that. (laughs) I came to believe I have a ticking time bomb in my chest. If this thing ruptures, it's going to be a hello Jesus moment. And for the first four days, I was a mess. I mean, a mess. 
I know I've written a book on anxiety. I know I've written a book on fear. I know I should have read my own books. <laughs> I was a mess. I was really wrestling with God over this. I stated my case with him many times a day, those first four days. This isn't supposed to happen. I'm still young. I didn't do anything to deserve this. I've got things to do. I've got a family to love. I've got dreams yet to fulfill. This isn't supposed to happen. And on the fourth day, about mid-morning as I was sitting on a couch outside on our porch, God told me. He said in no uncertain terms, Max, you're not in charge. Hmm. And he's right. I guess I needed that reminder. Like Jacob. I didn't have a white flag. If I had, I would have waved it. I surrendered. And I said, not my will, but your will be done. And an extraordinary lift of the weight occurred. The condition was still there, but the anger was gone. There was a surrender that took place. The fight ended. For the next couple of weeks, I was aware of the condition, but I wasn't defined by it. And then the most wonderful thing happened. Dean Lund and I went to the doctor when the test results came in. And I was well aware that he might say, Locato, this thing's bigger than we thought. You're not leaving here today. We're going to crack open your chest. But that's not what he reported. Would you like to know what he reported? I'll tell you next week. <laughs> Here's what he said. Well, it's interesting. The earlier measurement was 4.9 centimeters. This measurement is 4.4 centimeters. Now, Dean is much faster with math than I am. And so she said, you're saying it's smaller? And he said, maybe this test is more dependable. And in my mind, I'm thinking, or maybe God in his kindness just reached around that bulge and said, this far and no further. What I do know is that when I finally quit fighting his plan and trusting, everything changed. Jacob emerged from Jabbok at once stronger and weaker than ever. He walked with a limp, but he walked with God. Israel, his new name, Israel was buoyed not by his shrewdness or success, but by God. What about you? What I didn't know when I first read this story some 45 years ago is every journey to Canaan passes through Jabbok. Everybody. I don't know anyone who doesn't know Jabbok. Maybe you just didn't know the name. Or maybe you've not known it yet, but you will. Jabbok is when we stop depending on self and learn to cast ourselves entirely upon God. And that's a good thing. That's a good thing. And we continue our walk toward Canaan aware that there's a canopy of angels above us. A good God to lead us. And though we have our limps and issues... We still walk as Israel, God's new people. And that's a good thing. 
Amen. Heavenly Father, we bless you now for your word, for your story. And Father, we now ask your Holy Spirit to come and minister among us and to us. Through the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.